All right, everyone, welcome to lesson 12. Uh, so on the previous lesson, lesson 11, we learned that derivatives work pretty well with adding and subtracting functions. So if you wanted to do the derivative of, say, x squared plus x cubed, then that just amounts to doing each one of these separately. I mean, the derivatives can be seen to ignore the plus sign. And the same would work for negative signs as well. So that's pretty nice. That's pretty convenient for um, addition and subtraction. But oftentimes we have different types of functions multiplied together. So does the same thing work for multiplication? So if I have x squared times x cubed, and I try to do the derivative of those uh, multiplied together, would that be the same thing as just doing each one separately, then multiplying? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's see if we end up getting the same thing. So let's imagine that we have x squared times x cubed. So supposedly, and I'm going to put this in quotes because as we'll see, this might not actually end up being true. Let's see what happens if we multiply the derivatives of these together. So if we use the power rule from last time, the derivative of x squared, we bring the 2 down to the front, lower the power by 1, and that gives us 2x. And if we do the same thing with x cubed, we bring the 3 down to the front and then lower the power to be x squared right here. So if we were to combine these together, 2 times 3 is 6, x times x squared is x cubed. So according to this rule, we should end up with 6x cubed. But on the other hand, let's suppose that we were to multiply these together in here. So x squared times x cubed is x to the fifth. And then if we were to do the derivative of x to the fifth using the power rule, we would get 5x to the fourth. Now I know that I can do all three of these steps. There's nothing wrong with this. And there's nothing wrong with what I did after this equal sign right here, like the derivative of each of these is really these, and then multiplying them gives this. So it seems like the problem, the reason why we get two different answers, is this equation right here. We can't just split the derivative up over multiplication, because we'll get two different answers, one of which is definitely going to be wrong. So what are we supposed to do instead? Because it's pretty often that we'll encounter functions that are multiplied together, how do we take derivatives of functions like that? And it turns out that there's a special way of doing so. So let me, let me illustrate this with a picture. So let's say we have some kind of region right here, and the length of this side of this rectangle will be f of x. So from here to here, we're imagining this length being f of x. We'll put like maybe zero right here. And then we'll imagine this side of the rectangle, this length, being g of x. And if we look at f of x times g of x, so this length times this length, we end up getting an area, right? So this will be our area right here of f of x times g of x. Okay, now let's say that we were to change x by a little bit. So we're going to have a very tiny change in x. So let's say that maybe up here, if we change x by an amount h, where h is really tiny, this is our new value of f. So f of x was here, and then maybe f of x plus h is a little bit bigger. And let's suppose the same thing happens with g of x. So this will now be g of x plus h. What happens then is f of x plus h times g of x plus h will now be this slightly bigger rectangle here. And we can imagine this length right here as our change in f, which I'm going to represent by a delta f. Remember, delta means difference or change. And then this over here will be our change in g, the change in these lengths right here. Now, my goal is to understand what the change in a is going to be right here. So what I want to know about is delta a. How much did the area of this change? Well, let's see here. So the area changed by this rectangle's amount. So the height of this was delta f, and then the length of this rectangle up here is g of x plus h, because that's how long this line all the way across is. So this rectangle here, including this little intersection box, will be delta f times g of x plus h. 
And then in the same way, if we want to get the area of this rectangle right here, the amount that A changed in this direction, we would do it the other way. So we would have delta G as the length or the width of this thin rectangle, and then f of x plus h is the length here. So then we're going to have f of x plus h times delta G. Now, that's almost correct, but when we did these rectangles, so we have this rectangle here including the box, and then this rectangle here including this tiny rectangle, we accidentally counted for this rectangle twice because they're included in both of the rectangles that we got here. So I need to subtract off delta F times delta G, which is the size of this little box, to compensate. So we accidentally double counted that, so I'm going to need to subtract delta F times delta G. And this will be the change in our area, which is all of this new stuff that we added to our original area here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide everything by h. So I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by h. And remember, h is our tiny little change in delta x. So it's a tiny amount of difference with our delta x. And this is the same thing that h has meant before when we talked about derivatives. Now, all we need to do now that we have this, remember what the derivative is, we don't just divide by h, we send h to 0. So now I'm going to do the limit as h goes to 0 of both sides of this. And since they're equal, the limit of both sides should be the same. So I'm going to have the limit of delta a over h is the limit as h goes to 0 of delta f times g of x plus h over h. And I'm going to write the h only there for a reason we'll see in a second. And then we have the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h delta g. And then I'm going to put the h there for a reason we'll see in a moment. And then finally we have the limit of these two deltas, delta f delta g. And then I'm only going to divide the delta g by h. Okay. Now, this function here, this is the change in f times g. So we're looking at the change of f times g over h. This is none other than the derivative of f of x times g of x. Because remember what a is. a is f times g right here. So if we're looking in the change of this divided by our change in x, which is h, that's going to be the derivative of these two functions. All right, now let's look at the other side here. We see we have the limit as h goes to 0 of delta f over h, or our change in f over change in x. So this right here, without the g, will be the derivative of f. So this will be df dx. So this part will give us the derivative of f. And then as I send h to 0, this g here that doesn't have the h anymore, this g right here will just go to g of x, because this h will go to 0. All right, so I have the derivative of f and then times the original function, g. Then for this part, I have exactly the opposite. So as h goes to 0, this f on its own will just be f of x. And then I have delta g over delta x, or h. And as that goes to 0, I end up getting dg dx, or the derivative of g. Now finally, we have this uh, interesting little piece over here. So notice that I have the limit as h goes to 0 of delta g over delta or over h, which is exactly the same as what I get here. So this part is going to head to g prime of x, or dg dx. But now the thing is, is that this was multiplied by f, but this is multiplied by delta f. Now as h goes to 0, delta f will go to 0 as well. And why is that? Because delta f is f of x plus h minus f of x. So as h goes to 0, these will become the same, so delta f will go to 0. So we have this part that's going to g prime, but then it's going to be multiplied by something going to 0. So effectively what happens is this little part cancels out right here. And in general, anytime we have two tiny rates of change multiplied together, we can consider that as zero. That's a theme that shows up through a lot of calculus. If we ever have two of these multiplied together, not just one, this will probably end to zero. And here we go. This actually gives us our rule for doing the derivative of two functions multiplied together. So there are two different names for this. This is called the product rule because you're taking the derivative of the product or multiplication 
of two functions, uh, but it's also called the Leibniz rule, and it's named after one of the founders of calculus. You'll also see this name appearing as well. All right, so that's kind of the derivation of this. I wanted to show you where this came from so you don't just see it as magic here. Um, but the derivation um, kind of hides something that I think is really important about the product rule. The way to imagine the product rule is you take turns taking the derivative of each function. That's the way to imagine the product rule or Leibniz rule. So for example here, f got to have its derivative taken and g needs to wait its turn. And then f now that it has its derivative taken, it can wait while g has its derivative taken. So you kind of take one derivative at a time and keep the other function the same. That's hands down the best way of thinking about the product rule. All right, so there's, there's the derivation. This is the formula we're gonna be using here. So let's put it into practice. Let's see a few examples of this. So let's say that we have f of x being x squared times e to the x. So we have two different functions multiplied together here. All right, well, let's figure out what the derivative is. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of the first piece, x squared first, so I have 2x, and then I'm going to leave e to the x alone. So I'm not going to do the derivative of that at all. Okay, that means we did this part of the rule. Then I'm going to leave x squared alone. It already had its time in the sun where it had its derivative taken. And now I'm going to do the derivative of e to the x. But the thing is, is that the derivative of e to the x, as we saw last lesson, is just e to the x. So there we go. There's our derivative. And if you like we can simplify this, or at least factor an e to the x out, so it looks like that, right there. And that's it, that's the product rule in action. Let's see another example. Okay, let's say that we have y is x squared plus x plus one times x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. Okay, now the previous example we really needed the product rule in order to do that. There's no way to rewrite this as one function that we already know how to do the derivative of. So we needed the product rule here. Here we technically don't need the product rule. We could have done this last lesson because what we could do is we could foil out these two polynomials that are multiplied together. Um, but as you can see here, this is a four-term polynomial. This is a three-term polynomial. That would take a while. So while we could do this the old-fashioned way, or what we learned last lesson, the product rule will make things easier here. So if I want to know what y prime is, I'm going to do the derivative of this, which will be 2x plus 1, and then the derivative of that is 0 because it's a constant. I'll leave this alone. And then I'll leave the first one alone and then do the derivative of the second one. So I have 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. And there we go. I instantly found the derivative and I didn't need to foil anything out. Now granted, if you wanted to get a more simplified version of this, you would probably have to foil everything out there. But if all you want is a derivative, then this is all you need to do. So you can use the product rule to help you save time, even if you don't need to use it. All right, let's look at another example here. Let's say that we have f of t is going to be 1 plus t times e to the t times t squared minus 1 right here. So I'm going to change up the variables. t is another common variable in addition to x that we see, so I want to get you guys exposure to that. All right, so this one definitely looks like a good product rule problem because uh, we see two functions multiplied together here. Now I'm going to do something a bit different for this one to, to illustrate something. So I'm going to find f prime of t. I'm going to leave this first piece alone 
and then do the derivative of this. So the derivative of t squared minus 1 is 2t, and then the derivative of this is, is 0, because it's a constant. Now, you might protest and say, oh, well, in all the other ones, we took the derivative of the first part first and left the second alone. And it turns out that the product rule doesn't care which one you do first. So I could have written this as f dg dx and then df dx g. I could have done it the other way if I wanted to, and it would have been exactly the same. Because remember, you can add things together in any order. So just because you can add things in any order, that means you could do the product rule in any order. So you can choose which one you want to take the derivative of first. And no matter which one you choose, you'll end up with the same answer regardless. So I'm going to do it this way, and I'll still end up with the same answer. All right, next, I'm going to leave this alone now. And it's time for me to take the derivative of the other piece. Now, the derivative of 1 will be 0, so that's OK. But I need to do the derivative of t e to the t. So I'm just going to write that here, the derivative of t e to the t. Now, why didn't I just go ahead and do it right away? The fact is, is that I need to do a product rule on this one as well. In order to do the derivative of this, I need to do another product rule. So that's something that's going to appear pretty often in derivative rules, as we'll learn more and more of them. There are often times where we need to use a rule more than once or a combination of different rules in order to do the derivative. So this is an instance where I had to use the product rule twice in the same problem. So I use the product rule overall on these two terms, but then in order to do the derivative of this individual term, I need to use the product rule. All right, well, let's rewrite everything we have so far. This is all good. And then now if I do the product rule here, I'll do the derivative of t first and get 1. And then I have e to the t, which I'll leave alone. Then I'll leave the t alone, take the derivative of e to the t. But as we're experienced with now, the derivative of e to the t is e to the t. And there we go. We've gotten rid of all our derivatives here. Now, if we wanted to, we could FOIL all that out. Maybe there's some things that can cancel. But our goal is to just find the derivative for now. We don't need to worry about simplifying it. Although there will be instances later where we will want to simplify what we have. But I'll talk about that when we get to it. All right, I'm going to do two more examples of the product rule here. And then I'll move to the other rule we're going to learn today, the quotient rule. All right, this one's a bit different. Let's say that y is equal to some function f of x times x squared. So we don't have a formula for f of x. What we do know is that f of 1 is going to be 2. And we know that f prime of 1 will be negative 1. So we know these two facts about our function, but we don't really know anything else. What we want to know for this problem, our objective, is to get y prime with 1 plugged in for x. So this is our goal for the problem here. And we'll supposedly be able to do it with just this information. We don't even need to know what the formula for f of x is. All right, well, let's get started. So we want to know the derivative of y. We, our goal is to get y prime of 1. So why don't we take the derivative of y? Well, let's see here. I'm going to do the product rule here because I have f of x times x squared. So I'm going to do the derivative of f first and get f prime of x. That's really the best I can do since I don't know what the formula is here. And I'll leave the x squared alone. Then I'm going to leave f of x alone and I'm going to multiply by the derivative of x squared, which is 2x right here. And there we go. We did the product rule with y prime. All right, now we're going to see what happens when we plug in x equals 1 for our derivative here. So this is going to be f prime of 1 times 1 squared plus f of 1 times 2 times 1, if I substitute 1 in for all of these x's. All right, f prime of 1 is negative 1 times 1 squared will be negative 1. And then f of 1 equaling 2 tells us that this will be 2 times 2 times 1, so that will be 4, meaning that we end up getting 3 
for y prime of 1 here. Now, for those of you who will eventually take differential equations, uh, this is a pretty common piece of information to have, to know about both a function and its derivative at a particular point. So I want to get you guys some exposure to that before you get to that class. All right, I'm going to do one more example of the product rule to illustrate something that is pretty neat and it's going to save us some time in the future. Uh, let's try to do the derivative of f of x equaling x squared plus 1 times x times e to the x here. So you see we have three functions multiplied together. We have x squared plus 1 times x times e to the x. Now I guess I could distribute the x in here and make it only two functions, but I want to show you guys something that we can do here. There's something which uh, is called by many uh, the triple product rule. If we have three functions multiplied together, then how do we do the derivative of that? And the same philosophy that underlies our original product rule will come into play here. What we're going to do is we're going to take turns doing the derivative of each function. So I'm going to take the derivative of f first and leave the other two alone. Then I'm going to leave f alone now. It's had its chance. And I'm going to give g a chance to have its derivative out. And then finally, f and g are done. And finally, h will have a chance to have its derivative. We have f prime g h, f g prime h, and f g h prime right here. And so this is, what we're doing here is essentially the same thing we were doing before. We take derivatives of each function one at a time and keep the other functions there in their original form. All right, so this is a kind of a generalized version of the product rule. And this pattern continues for four or even more functions. You essentially just take the derivative of each one in turn. All right, now we could, we could prove this the same way we did earlier, but then we would have to kind of draw a cube of three different things, because three things multiply together, we get a volume, and now we get really messy. So we're just going to have to take on faith that this is going to work out. All right, so let's apply this to our function here. So I'm first going to do the derivative of this piece. So the derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of 1 is 0 and then I'll leave x e to the x alone. Next, I'll leave x squared alone and do the derivative of x. And the derivative of just x is going to be 1. Then finally, I'm going to leave these two alone and do the derivative of e to the x, but as we've seen many times now, the derivative of e to the x is, well, e to the x. So there we go. There is our derivative using what's called the triple product rule. All right, so there we go. So these are all the different scenarios in which we may encounter the product rule. Now, as you can imagine, if multiplication didn't work very well for derivatives, then division may also have some issues. And that turns out to be the right assumption. We can't just split up derivatives over division either. That's going to be a problem. So in order to deal with two functions multi or divided uh, by one another, we're going to have something called the quotient rule. Now, I'm not going to go into the proof of this one. Um, I'm just going to state this one because it's proof, or at least the proof that I'm aware of, uses something that we haven't learned yet. So I'm just going to do this for now. All right, so if, let's say we have the derivative of f divided by g. What's the um, overall derivative going to be of those combined? What we do is in our denominator, we end up having g squared. So we just square the bottom of whatever is down there, and that's going to be it. Then what we do is we put a copy of our original bottom up here. So if g was down here and now goes up here, and we stick that next to f prime, not f, but f prime. Then we have a subtraction symbol, and we do the opposite. We have g prime, our original bottom, having its derivative, and then we have f up here. So this part up here may seem kind of similar to the product rule, and it's actually where it ends up coming from, 
This is the product rule, only we have a subtraction instead of addition. Now when there's a subtraction involved, one of them has the sign, so the order for this matters. So we do the derivative of whatever our top was first, then we do the derivative of our bottom. So it's a product rule with a minus, and then we divide by g squared. That's how I remember it. We have a product rule with a minus, and then we divide by our original bottom squared right here. All right, let's see an example of this in action. Let's say we have y is x squared plus 1 divided by e to the x. Let's say we wanted to find the derivative of this, and we could try out our new quotient rule here. So y prime, let's see what that's going to be. So the way this works, so this top part will be like our f of x, and this bottom will be g of x, like we have over here. So what happens, I like to take care of the bottom first because it's the easiest. Uh, we just take e to the x and we square it. So we have e to the x, and that will be squared now. Then we put a copy of e to the x, which was originally on my bottom, up here. So you have e to the x up there. Then we multiply by f prime. Now f of x is x squared plus 1, so if we do the power rule to do the derivative of this, the derivative of x squared will be 2x, and then the derivative of 1 will be 0. So this is my gf prime right here. We put a minus sign that comes from the formula, and then we switch it. We do g prime, the derivative of our bottom, times the original top. So the derivative of my bottom, since it's e to the x, will actually just be another e to the x, and then I don't do the derivative of f here. And there we go. There is our derivative here. Uh, this time I'm going to simplify things um, just to make it look a little cleaner. So we have e to the x, e to the x, and then 2 e to the x is down here. So this, this, and then one of these will go away. So I end up with 2x minus x squared minus 1 over a single e to the x here. And that's going to be my derivative using the quotient rule. Now this formula is a little bit complicated, but once you use it enough times, it'll eventually kind of bake into your head. I wouldn't recommend sitting there staring at this formula until you memorize it. I would instead practice a bunch of problems with the quotient rule, and then when you use it enough, you'll end up memorizing it because you've had to reference it so much. All right, let's do maybe two more examples of this. All right. Um, so let's see here. My next question is going to be a little bit different. Where is the tangent line? And I'll put in parentheses lines because there may be more than one like this. Of f of x equals x over e to the 2x horizontal. Okay, so this is a bit different. We're not just taking a derivative here. We need to answer this question. Where are the tangent lines horizontal? Now let's dissect this here. So a line, so we're looking for lines, and we're looking where lines are horizontal. So horizontal lines have a slope of 0. So that's true for any horizontal line. The slope of that line is going to be 0. It's just going to be a constant function. So what we need is we need the slope of these lines to be 0. Now the slope of a tangent line, remember that's another way of thinking about the derivative. So the slope of a tangent line is our derivative, and we want the slope to be 0. So if we put these facts together, what we're doing is we're looking for solutions to the equation f prime of x equals 0. We want to find all the x that makes this true. Because if f prime is 0, we're going to have a horizontal tangent line there. So what we need to do is we need to do the derivative of this function and then set it equal to 0 and see what x values we find. All right, so let's rewrite this. We have x over e to the 2x. So now we want to find f prime of x. And that will require us to use our quotient rule. So what do we do first? 
we simply square the bottom. Now using exponent rules, e to the 2x, when we square that, let me write this over here, e to the 2x squared, remember with exponent rules we multiply the exponents together. So this will be e to the 4x. So if we square e to the 2x, we're going to get an e to the 4x down here. All right, that's g squared. Then g, we'll just put a copy of this up here. And we multiply by the derivative of our top. So the derivative of x will just be 1. All right, then we subtract, and we now do the derivative of our denominator. Now remember from last lesson, the derivative of e to just x is its own derivative. But if we have a coefficient in front of that x, like e to the 2x, what we do is we stick that coefficient out in front. So when we do g prime, the derivative of the bottom will be 2 e to the 2x. And notice we don't put the x out there, we just put the coefficient of x out here. So this is going to be g prime, and then f will have an x like that. All right, so there is our derivative. Now remember, we're trying to see where this is going to be equal to 0 right here. Now, a fraction can only be 0 if its numerator is 0. So when we have this equation right here, what we're really doing is we're trying to see where e to the 2x minus 2x e to the 2x, I move this x right there, we want to see where that's equal to 0. Now what I can do further, um, what I could do here is I could factor out an e to the 2x, because that seems to be in both of these. So I have 1 minus 2x here is 0. Okay, now if we think about facts about exponential functions, exponential functions can never be negative. e raised to any power is going to be positive no matter what. So this part's always greater than 0, but we need one of these to be 0 if they're going to multiply to be 0. So that means that 1 minus 2x is really the thing that needs to be 0 here, because it can't be e to the 2x. Now I'm going to add 2x over here and divide by 2, giving me that x equals 1 half. And that's going to be my answer here. At x equals 1 half, this function will have a horizontal tangent line, meaning roughly in that area, the function is going to be flat, at least for a moment, around x equals 1 half. All right, I want to do one final example here. So let's say I have a function g of x, which is 1 over another function f of x. And my goal for this problem is to find out what g prime is in terms of f and f prime. Now this will actually be pretty useful because it's going to be very common for us to see a, a 1 over a function that we're familiar with. So this will give us a formula for doing the derivative of 1 over a function. All right, so we want to do g prime here. All right, now this is a fraction. This is a quotient of two different functions, even though this is kind of a boring constant function. So I'm going to use the quotient rule here. So let's bring that back for a moment so we can grain it into our heads what it is. So I look at my quotient rule and I see that it's this right here. So it's a little bit confusing because my bottom is f here but g here. Uh, but we can think of this as we have the bottom squared. So I have f of x and so whatever that is is going to be squared. Then I bring whatever my bottom was up here. So I have just f of x not squared. Then I multiply by the derivative of whatever my original top function was. Now the derivative of the top function here, 1, is actually 0 because it's the derivative of a constant. So we end up with a 0 there. Then we subtract right here, and we do the derivative of whatever my bottom was. So my bottom was f, so that means we have f prime of x. And then we multiply by whatever my original top function was. So that'll be 1. Okay, now we're multiplying by 0 here. So it doesn't matter what f of x is. This part will go away. And this will give us our final answer here 
of negative f of x over f of x squared right here. And this applies to any function we want that we can take the derivative of. So for example, let's say that f of x is x squared plus 1. Then if g of x is 1 over x squared plus 1, so I'm effectively just putting x squared plus 1 in place of that right here, this is going to be my x squared plus 1, then that means we could just use this formula to do g prime. So g prime of x will be negative the derivative of the bottom. So the derivative of this is 2x, and we stick a negative there. And then we have whatever our bottom is squared. So there we go. So we are able to really easily figure out the derivative of 1 over a function using this formula right here. All right, that's about it for today. So next time we're going to be learning some more derivative rules. So I will see you guys then.